Hello everyone and welcome to this Introduction to Arts Accessibility class. My name is Shauna Barnes. I am a disabled artist living in Maine and a lot of what I'm going to go over with you tonight is things that I have found to be beneficial and helpful for me in adapting my own practice as well as adapting the classes that I teach to other disabled veterans or, and or children who take my art classes. One of the things I've encountered is that accessibility tools as they're produced can be cost prohibitive. I say can be because there are some that if you know where to look can be very economical. However, if you're in a position where you have to buy multiples, that can still get costly. For example, if you're a teacher and you have several students in your classes with disabilities. So this is just going to be a very quick overview of different things that I have found that help in that process, as well as some areas for you to go and look and things to try. A lot of these tips and suggestions come from having to think outside of the box. Once you see them, you might think, oh, well, why didn't I think of that? A lot of times until you have to, you just don't know or you won't. There's a reason that they say necessity is the mother of all invention. Because when you have to do something, you start thinking of all of the different ways that you can accomplish this task. So one of the first things I wanna go over are tools that are already available for the accessible type platform or to help students. One is just this pencil egg. It's, well, it's made for a pencil, but it will fit on some paint brushes. I say some. So this has a relatively thick handle. This tool will not work on a smaller paintbrush. It's only going to work on those that have a similar diameter or width as a pencil. You can also purchase ergonomic paint brushes, but again, these are cost prohibitive and that triangular shape may not work for everyone. Especially if the student you're teaching has any kind of contractures or other grip strength issues. Even the egg, I have it up more because holding it like this is very awkward for me. I use it more as a rest in my palm and then just kind of rest it there. I don't even really hold it like a pencil when I have to use the grip. I'll just kind of cradle it right in between the natural curvature that your hand makes where your fingers attach to your palm. And then I'll put the brush off in between my middle and my ring finger. And then when I need to, I just, I sit and I use more of my wrist to get the motion down. So arts accessibility and finding those adaptive aids is more than just the tools. It's how you utilize those tools. For some people, this egg might be a weird shape, and that's when you get into more of the custom designs that we'll talk about a little later. Another tool that you can get, here's a, an example of the unopened one. They're called Finger Max, ages three to 99. I find the age limit a little off-putting simply because they're small and your adult students may have difficulty, especially if they have larger fingers or larger hands, getting comfortable using them. But they're just very cheap and simple paint brushes, so synthetic bristles, and they fit right on your finger. So you can kind of see how some of my fingers bulging out as I try to really sit that fingertip in the tip of the paintbrush. And after time, that can either cut off circulation or just be uncomfortable. So I think this is a great adaptation for your students or people with smaller hands, but anybody with larger hands or fingers may find it difficult. This would also be an excellent sensory tool for those if you wanna work on uh, finger painting and you have students who are averse to that sensory output or input the feeling of the paint and the paint on the paper on their finger and anything else along those lines. This will give them the ability to still get that motion of finger painting without getting the paint on their fingers. Now on this one, I haven't created my tool yet, but I've simply pulled the bristles out of the top. I think this set costs four or five dollars. 
So for a single set, it's relatively economical. But if you need additional sizes or anything else like that, you're going to have to custom make them. But again, you know, you can do it on the index finger. It's not going to fit on the thumb. It will probably fit on the adult pinky, but even here, my pinky is a little too small and it doesn't really sit snug. So you're looking at your three middle fingers, your ring finger, your index finger, and your middle finger. But even here, again, it's going to be a little tight. So these are going to be great for, as I said, your younger students, anybody with smaller hands, and those that have pretty good mobility with their fingers. You know, they can go up and down and circular and don't have any issues or contractures that are going to limit their hand or finger mobility. Okay, so now that's all I personally have on hand as far as commercially available adaptive tools. Everything else I do, I create because that way I can make it so it fits me and it fits my hands. So this is a gum stimulator, if it'll focus, there we go. And it makes a really good sculpting tool, especially for fur. What I've done here is bulked the tool up a little bit. So the diameter for that is about the same as, well, it's actually a little smaller than this craft knife, the X-Acto, and it's just too small. So I bulked it out with tape and that can be a really simple and easy way to make the tools a little more bulky. And even this, I have it thinner up front where my knuckles are gonna be, and then thicker along the back where it's gonna rest on my hand, okay? So one of the things to keep in mind is the specific needs of your student. Each of your students may need a little different placement for where items need to be bulked out or a little thinner, or maybe more triangular or square. So you can kind of see that even though all of these options are going to be great and they're economical and they can be fast way, ways to incorporate all of your students regardless of abilities, it's still gonna take some time and finesse with learning what your students' needs are. The next product I'm gonna show you is Impressive Putty and it's from a main based business called Composite Mold. Now in its current state, it's pretty firm. I keep it in the plastic bag so it doesn't dry out. Okay, so it's firm, a little flexible, but you're not gonna be able to do anything with it here. What you do is you heat this up in the microwave and then you roll it into a coil and wrap it around your tool. I have some pictures that I'll link to in the show notes page that show how I use the impressive putty to adapt a tool. And really all I did is what I just said. Warm, a, warm it up in the microwave for about 15 seconds, and then it becomes much more pliable. And I rolled it into a coil. And then I have wooden sculpting tools, which can be difficult to hold when I'm having a flare. I've got myasthenia gravis and also a hypermobility joint disorder. So sometimes I have issues with grip strength or just getting my hands to really work and be able to push clay around. So what I did with this was I wrapped it around my tool, and I wrapped it in such a way that allowed me to cradle the tool right in my hands. And I can use this point in my hand between the thumb and the index finger, almost as a fulcrum. And then it just rests right in between my two fingers, like I have shown here. What the coil around the middle of the tool does is it provides more leverage to be able to really get that, that pushing or the pulling or the up and downward movement when it comes to pushing clay around. You can also use this, just part of it, and if you need a little extra just around one of the tools, so you're almost gonna create um, a well. I'm gonna use some adhesive tack to demonstrate what you can do with this impressive putty because when it's warmed up, it has very similar consistency to uh, this adhesive tack or the poster putty is what we used to call it when I was growing up.
But one of the things that I love about the impressive putty is its uses. When you're done or when you get a new student, or maybe even between classes because you have different students in different classes with different needs. If you have a microwave in your classroom, you can reuse this and create adaptive tools every single class that are custom made for your students, which is pretty amazing if I do say so myself. So once you have your impressive putty and it's heated in the microwave, you take it and you wrap it around. And then once it cools, it will harden and stay right in that position. When you want to take it and move it, if it's on a surface that is microwave safe, like a wooden tool, you can put it back in the microwave and reheat it. If you put it on a metal tool, you put the metal tool with the impressive putty wrapped around into a plastic bag and you can submerge it in hot water and that will loosen up and make the impressive putty more malleable so that way you can pull it off. If you do use wooden tools with this product, I am going to recommend that you put a protective layering over the wooden tool or really any tool and that will just protect the tool itself as well as make the removal of the impressive putty easier. Okay, by protective covering that could be simply a layer of tape around the tool for example or saran wrap or tin foil, whatever you have on hand that can act like a barrier between the impressive putty and your tool. There is a little bit of an oil in the impressive putty and that doesn't really come out in your hands if you find that after multiple uses it's getting to the point where it's not malleable and you can't really move it around a whole lot they have a conditioner that you can get as well so that way you can literally get hundreds of uses out of this product and one this size was about eleven dollars if i remember correctly and i can't remember the size but it was their base kind of introductory to the product I'm just partial to this one because it's a Maine company. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm in Maine and I enjoy supporting local. Okay, so what you can also do with the impressive putty, I mentioned doing stops or creating gaps on your tools. If you need a little valley for a student to rest their finger on, you can take that impressive putty or even polymer clay or another product that I'm going to show you in a little bit called epoxy sculpt. And you can wrap it around the tools. And now you've created this place where your students can rest their fingers. And a lot of times all they'll need is that stop gap to keep their fingers from moving forward or something to grab onto that's a little more bulky than say your simple pencil mark or the pencil cover that you can get, but not quite as bulky as the egg. Okay. Another option that you can use, again, we're going to be talking about those with grip strength issues or physical disabilities, contractures, that sort of stuff, is a piping cover or pool noodle. If you hit the dollar store when it's off season, you can get pool noodles for a dollar a piece. I use them for shipping my larger sculptures and to create adaptive tools. So if you have somebody with contractures and their hands is kind of stuck like this, but a pool noodle is the perfect size. You can cut holes in the pool noodle or you can just take your tool and push it right through because it's soft enough. And now you have a completely custom tool and as long as they can bend the wrist, they can now participate independently without having to have somebody do one over one or put their hand, your hand over theirs in order to get them to participate. Okay, so pool noodles are invaluable for your classroom. If you have any kind of scissors or anything like that, if you have pool noodles with a smaller diameter or the pipe cover, you can simply cover your scissors or pliers if you're doing some kind of jewelry uh, class. And now, especially with these larger ones with smaller pliers, this technique may not work. But now you have something that's a little more substantial that will allow the student with grip issues to participate and cut items independently. A lot of these tips and tricks that I'm showing you are intended to allow your student 
to participate in the classroom activity or in the studio activity to the fullest of their ability. Oftentimes, we're not going to know what that ability is until we push them and encourage them to try these things on their own. So definitely make sure you're communicating however that student communicates to find out what it is they want and try to uh, be able to accommodate that through some of these other tools and adaptive aids. Now, two other products, both from Aves Studio, one's epoxy sculpt and one is epoxy paste. They both come in part A and part B. I just happen to have one of each for these. The epoxy sculpt is a self-hardening epoxy putty. Uh, let's see. I have a tool. Oh, geez. We're going to edit that out. Maybe. <laughs> That's what I get for putting my tools behind. So I've used epoxy sculpt to make multiple tools because it is self-hardening. Okay, oh, let's get you. So this, for example, is a scoring tool for clay. So I've used the epoxy sculpt to attach sewing needles to the top of the tool, as well as to beef up the handle. So the divot here is for my fingers to rest, so that way I don't have to hold on tight to be able to grip it. When I'm having issues and I need to use it, it just rests right in there. Now for this, I wish the handle were a little longer so I could use this area as the fulcrum, but it's just wide enough, or long enough, I should say, to be able to use. For this, you do want to wear gloves when you're mixing the two parts. After you mix the two parts, you don't need to wear the gloves anymore to apply it. So as I mentioned, this is a self-hardening, and it's a putty-like consistency once both parts are mixed. The reason I like this is if you're going to have a student take these tools with them for the duration of the art class or you know, all the way up through from middle school to high school, elementary school, their hands are going to be too small. So you're going to be constantly having to make adjustments, but you can make these tools and it's a permanent fix. Okay. This is not coming off. I also use it to do uh, sculpture repair if I need to. That's how durable it is. It's rock hard when it cures. But that way, once you apply the putty, you can have the student put their hand on however is most comfortable for them to grip. And now it's a completely customized tool for them and their needs. So now we're going to talk about students with visual deficiencies or trouble with anything on the visual spectrum whether they're totally blind or they just use Braille to read because that's what's easier for them. If you have tools in your studio that you need to identify and you there's too many of them to just do different textures, you know, sandpaper, paper towel, however you differentiate between the tools, and you need to actually use Braille, I'm going to recommend epoxy paste. So just like with the epoxy sculpt, it comes with two parts, part A and part B. Instead of mixing it with your hands, you will need a dish. Make sure it's disposable because this also hardens rock hard once it completely cures, which takes about 24 hours. But with this, what you can do is you can take a needle tool or a piece of wire or your gum stimulator. And once the epoxy paste is mixed, excuse me, you can then take that and put small dots on the tools and make it braille letter, have your own braille lettering system. So for example, for all sculpting tools, you could label a wooden thumb, because this helps move the clay around, labeled S1, for example, for sculpting tool one. If you want a paintbrush, you could do P for paint, F for flat, because that is a flat headed paintbrush, one, or whatever size the paintbrush is, because all paintbrushes come with sizes. For example, this size is an eight. This small size is a round, because the tip is round, 
and four out of zero. It's a liner brush. It's intended for detail. So you can take all of those things into consideration and develop your own braille identification system for those students with vision impairments and then have that identification system listed in its own type of reference material that that student knows where it is or that they are handed so that way they can identify what those tools are. Guaranteed it won't take that student very long to remember, okay, the S1 is the sculpting tool. The PF5 is the flat paintbrush that I need, you know, and just whatever the labeling system is that you decide, they're going to be able to remember that and they are also going to be able to find their tools independently. One of the things that I try to focus on, as I've mentioned before, in all of my classes is encouraging that level of independence because they're going to need that when they get out into the real world. So those are just some of the tips and tricks that I personally use here in my studio. There's all kinds of other ones that we can get into. How you can use pool noodles and pipe covers to help bulk out other items in the studio. Like if you're doing a puppet class and you're doing marionettes and you want to support a student who has mobility difficulties and you want to help them stand, how you can use these to help cushion and support them as they stand so that way they can use the marionettes. How you can use these same tools and techniques to create adaptive musical instruments for maracas and tambourines and how you can change the texture and the feel of a tool to help those with sensory difficulties. So there's all kinds of different techniques that we can use and how you can use some of these materials that I've showed you today. I hope that what I've discussed is helpful and beneficial for you in your classroom and studio. If you have any questions at all, please, 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 please email me and ask me. My email is info at shawnabarnes.com. S-H-A-W-N-A-B-A-R-N-E-S. Also on my website, www.shawnabarnes.com, if you go over on the menu on the top of the screen and over on the right hand side, there's a resource tab. Find the Arts Accessibility tab and that has all of the information that I've provided publicly for all of these different types of topics. It's an area that is continually under development and is growing as I create more and more of these videos and classes. I'll also make announcements for when future classes and webinars are available. Some of the content is free, some of it is paid. So just keep that in mind as you're going across. Again, I hope you found this information helpful and beneficial. Please share this video with anybody who you think it could benefit, whether it's the student themselves who may need some ideas for adapting their own creative practice so that way they can participate, or a parent of a student or a teacher or an artist who teaches somebody with disabilities. I hope that anybody in any of these categories gets something from what I've said. If you have an adaptive technique that you've used that I haven't mentioned today, please let me know. I'd love to add that to my repertoire and my toolbox so that I can continue to help others. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you next time.